Uh, we now turn to Fahad Nazar, who will uh, uh, I would like to thank for his many timely uh, uh, tweets that alerted uh, many of uh, the specialists and, and colleagues early on about uh, King Abdullah's uh, condition on the night he passed away. Fahad, uh, we're looking forward uh, to your remarks about the implication of King Solomon's uh, assumption of uh, leadership in Saudi Arabia. And I know you want to start uh, to talk about the key foreign policy challenges uh, that uh, Riyadh faces. But if you could uh, please maybe just give us uh, your impressions of, uh, of the passing of King Abdullah. What, what was your reaction to the news? Um, well, uh, well, thank you uh, for having me, uh, Pat and Richard. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to be with you guys and uh, with uh, Ted as well, obviously. Um, well, initially, um, I think I speak on, you know, for many, many Saudis when I say that uh, my initial reaction was, was uh, sadness, really, because, um, you know, the king had been a fixture in Saudi politics for, for a very long time. Uh, as everybody knows, he had been de facto king since uh, 1995. Um, so at some point, especially, you know, in the past uh, four or five years, which have been very tur turbulent, I think his mere presence uh, was reassuring to, to many people. There are, um, many consider that, uh, again, his leadership was crucial uh, for overcoming, again, uh, many, many difficult junctures in, uh, in Saudi history, going back to uh, the September 11th attacks on the U.S., uh, which uh, were soon followed by terrorist attacks inside the kingdom in 2003. Um, and I think that his presence uh, was very reassuring to, uh, to Saudis as well as to uh, people in the wider international community. I think he made it um, a priority of his to, uh, to stand up to the uh, serious threat from Al-Qaeda and other uh, Islamist militant organizations. Um, and during the uh, the events that came to be known as the Arab Spring, uh, I think for Saudis, his again his uh, his presence um, and resolute policies, I think, proved to be crucial because, um, you know, as as one long term uh, long term regime after another fell, uh, I think it was natural for Saudis. Obviously, the Saudis were paying very close attention, and again, I think his mere presence there. Uh, was reassuring to uh, to many of them. Having said that, obviously the king was in his uh, early 90s and his uh, health had been deteriorating for, for quite a while. So it wasn't um, it wasn't a surprise that he had passed. But it, it was I, I think it was a very surreal experience uh, for me again as a Saudi to watch uh, people reacting. I was I was in the U.S. when when the king passed. I was in Saudi Arabia, but I did. Uh, for the first time, observed how Saudis reacted to the passing of a monarch uh, on social media. That was obviously, um, you know, in 2005 when when King Fahd died. Um, I barely had a I had a computer, but certainly didn't have uh, Twitter. And social media was not uh, anything uh, as what it is now. So um, it was an interesting experience to watch. The, the outpouring of, of, uh, of emotion coming uh, on social media, um, you know, hundreds of, if not thousands, certainly the, the ones that I came across, I can really say that hundreds of uh, Saudis expressed their, their sympathies, their sadness, uh, as the news broke, uh, that's how I found out, was, was online. Um, and uh, so that was that by itself was was uh, an unusual uh, experience and a sign of the the times, uh, so to speak. Now, um, having said that, and then as Ted already mentioned, um, I think the Saudi leadership uh, was keen on on, stress, on stressing that this um, that they had taken steps and precautions or uh, measures to make sure that the transition would be as smooth as possible. And that's why the uh, you know the the assumption of King Salman and then uh, the appointment of Crown Prince Mughal were uh, announced almost at the same time as the uh, as the king's passing. Um, within mere hours, King Salman delivered uh, a brief but but still uh, uh, not an insignificant speech. And I think if there's one theme that he uh, emphasized there, it was it was continuity. Um, at least during that speech, and I think that was important because, you know, we all know that for many months, if not years, uh, there's been much speculation in the uh, Western press primarily, but also some in, 
in the air press as well. But what will happen once um, King Abdullah passes, and you know the uh, we've seen we've all seen the articles about an impending uh, or looming succession struggle. Um, I think they wanted the Saudi leadership wanted to uh, kind of put an end to that uh, debate very quickly. Um, and they did that, uh, I think. Uh, and, and initially, I think again, it was the, it was meant to to reassure Saudis as well as the uh, uh, wider international community. Um, now, moving forward, I mean, the the region. I I can't really think of a, another period uh, in recent memory where where the region has has been in, in as much turmoil as it is now. Um, I think King Salman faces many, many challenges, uh, daunting challenges in the region, um, and he doesn't have that much time to uh, to mull things over. I think, um, you know, perhaps, and I, I wrote about this recently. I think Yemen, just due to its proximity, might be uh, the number one priority. Uh, Saudi Arabia has a long history of, of uh, a very close involvement in Yemeni politics. I think that Saudis, and perhaps understandably so, um, again due to, to a long history of, of, of uh, civil and of political turmoil in uh, Yemen, which has uh, gone, you know, multiple civil wars. Uh, the Saudis have argued that um, they need, at the very least, they need to make sure that the uh, violence does not spill over uh, into their territory, as, as has happened in the past. So I think a lot of people are watching closely. Uh, what King Salman is going to do about about that political takeover in Yemen? I don't think that the, the Saudi options are somewhat limited, um, as as you know anyone who has followed Yemeni politics over the years uh, understands. Uh, alignments have a very odd way of changing very quickly and fluidly in in Yemen. They change almost um, these days. It seems almost day to day. Um, and the Saudis have to navigate uh, uh, these these waters very carefully. Um, I think the Houthi presence and takeover has clearly worried them. Um, of course, the, the wider issue there is, and although there's disagreement as to the level of support that Iran is providing the Houthis, um, if you pick up a Saudi newspaper, I think that to a large extent, um, the Houthi takeover is seen as, as yet one manifestation of an Iranian encroachment. Um, on the Gulf, on you know Saudi Arabia's backyard, so to speak, uh, and I think that really adds adds uh, uh, an urgency to um, to the problems and the turmoil in Yemen. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the uh, the kingdom moves forward there. Um, just in terms of U U.S. Saudi relations, as I think uh, Ted aptly described it when the president went got his India. Um, trip short and went to uh, to Saudi Arabia to pay respects to the new king. He uh, took with him what uh, that uh, rightly called uh, American uh, political royalty. I mean, it wasn't just senior uh, people from, you know, pe uh, from the current administration, uh, as well as senior Republican leaders, but there were people from previous administrations, both uh, Republican and uh, and Democratic, I and mean, people like uh, Con Condoleezza Rice and James Baker, Sandy Berger. Um, I'm not sure that I that I've quite seen that in in quite a while. It was uh, kind of a who's who in American politics went uh, to Saudi Arabia to pay respects to the late king, but also um, as much as as it was also um, seemed like a concerted effort on the part of the president. To uh, perhaps turn a new page with Saudi Arabia, um, I think that it's fairly well documented that the past four or five years, uh, again since the uh, the Arab Spring, have been um, have have put quite a bit of strain on Saudi-U.S. relations. Um, I think beginning with uh, with uh, Egypt and the turmoil in Egypt and the uh, overthrow of Pre President Mubarak, um, it's by all accounts the Saudis were rather uh, uh, disappointed, upset uh, over that. Um, President Mubarak was one of their closest, most reliable allies for many years. And the perception in, uh, not just in Saudi Arabia, but I think the wider Gulf perhaps, and, and also the wider region, is that the uh, US um, should have done more um, to preserve President um, Mubarak's regime. Um, that's debatable, but certainly the Saudis were 
very disappointed uh, to see him go. Um, and uh, you know, then, then there's the issue of, of uh, Syria. Uh, I think going forward, uh, and of course uh, the, the Saudis have been fairly vocal in their support of uh, the U.S. strikes against ISIS strongholds in Syria and are taking part in that and have been very public about their involvement. But I think going forward at some point, uh, the Saudis and the Americans have to uh, perhaps come to a uh, I think they have to clarify where uh, their positions on, on the future of Syria and the future of the Assad regime specifically. Uh, I get the sense that there might be a bit of a disconnect there. Um, the Saudis um, have invested so much political capital uh, into their support of the opposition that it would be very, very difficult for them to turn a new chapter with Assad, um, as, as some in the West seem to be suggesting uh, it's not entirely clear to me where the administration stands in terms of the future of us do they are they ready to uh, again to are they taking that heeding that advice and, and uh, consider him the lesser of two evils or are they still committed to his uh, removal or ouster or uh, uh, that that's not entirely clear I think that's that's going to have to be uh, flushed out at some point. Um, just one last note, uh, I think Saudi Egyptian relations over the past few days have really come under a microscope. We've uh, probably all seen some of the, uh, the, the stories related to a supposed uh, leak that had uh, President, Egyptian President uh, Sisi speaking in, in less than glowing terms about uh, Saudi leaders. And some people are doubting the authenticity of the video, uh, of the audio. Um, be that as it may, uh, I think um, that there's a lot in the Saudi media as well as the wider Arab media about where do Saudi Egyptian relations move uh, go moving forward. Uh, there are some who are, are suggesting, and, and this is, I think, instructive, and it reminds me of 2005 when King Abdullah took over. There was a perception that King Abdullah would be uh, perhaps a little less uh, friendly to the West, uh, might be a, a bit more amenable to. Uh, strengthening his relations with the, with the Arab um, countries. So there's a bit in the, uh, again, in the Arab media about a supposed maybe uh, a change in, in the position of the uh, of Saudi Arabia vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the case right now, but uh, that obviously will will, uh, will affect and impact Saudi-Egyptian relations um, going forward. Um, so, you know, to make a to, Long story short, I think the, the uh, King Salman has a lot on his plate, uh, beginning with uh, Yemen, and then, uh, you know, it doesn't get any easier.